is in the reactions button, probably at the bottom of your screen. Um, so that's a little bit of just the technical part. Uh, and at Blue Sky, we like to start our programs by acknowledging that our work happens on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along what, what they called the Wimal and the Willamette, and we called the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. And that also in this online format, you are participating from other places perhaps, so you might wanna consider your own land acknowledgement reflecting your location. And we also realized that the very technology that makes these programs possible for us online is inequitably distributed and not equally accessible. And so we are creating new virtual displacements and exclusions through the technology. And we say all of this to call attention to the need for action now and the future to address these kinds of disparities. And that feels like thinking about disparities is obviously gonna be a big part of what we're talking about tonight. I started doing these salons in person in the gallery years ago because I wanted to create a chance for community around the work that hangs on the walls and also often poetry that I would pair with that work um, to have people engage in conversation and build understanding together. So when I pose questions, I'm never posing them thinking there's one right answer, but inviting us as a community to reflect on things and listen to each other and build connections with each other and deeper understanding. I always leave these sessions knowing more about the poetry and about the photography that I did when I came in, and I hope you will feel the same way. The past year has not just been about the pandemic, but about a new racial reckoning with a lot of hard conversations happening around the country and the world about race, about violence, about fear, and about grief. Um, and Blue Sky has really created a space for those conversations and you have kept coming together month after month to inhabit that space. And I just wanna acknowledge that tonight's conversation especially is gonna ask a lot of us. So, Expect there to be differences in experiences. Respect that there are differences in experiences. Remember that what are disturbing news headlines for some of us are lived experiences for others of us. Um, and as a high school student taught me to say at a Juneteenth rally in Portland last year, get comfortable with being uncomfortable and breathe. Let's all just do it. Like just one deep breath in please. We're gonna be remembering men, sons, whose last words were, I can't breathe. And the power of our breath to calm us and connect us is really important, I think. Um, we are right now reeling from mass shootings that have happened in the past week and or half or um, in the US. And I also wanted to acknowledge those, but also acknowledge that there's a difference in the terror from what seems like random violence and violence that is targeted, whether it's violence targeted at women, at Asian Americans, or as haunts the images we're gonna look at tonight um, that targets African Americans. And I'm just curious, I think that we're still at the point where I can actually see everybody um, on one screen. So how many of you have had a chance to see uh, uh, John's work as it's up on, John Henry's work as it's up in Blue Sky now. Oh, so most people have not, okay. Or maybe a mix. Um, it's amazing work and uh, it will take us amazing places. But again, we're, we're entering into a very emotional discussion. And I think I'll just jump in sharing my screen, hopefully properly. I, f I still feel the same panic like every time you'd think that I would be better by now. Spend some time with this photograph. Think about where your eyes go immediately and think about where you, what you only start to notice after some time with the photograph.
So I pose those two questions about where your eyes go immediately and what you only start to notice after time. And if you're comfortable starting there, we'll start there. Um, and again, if you can either put your comments in the chat or use the raise hand feature. I can't see people's actual physical hands once I'm sharing screen. And Zemi will tip me off as people raise their hands, I think. Chuck has his hand up. So for me, the first thing I notice is you see the, the my eye first goes to the boy's back or his skin. There's the sort of unusualness of seeing the, the bare skin. And then you see the target above the mother's head. Could you say a little bit more about like what's the emotional response that you have with the prominence of his bare skin in that photo? Emotionally, it somehow doesn't, the way that she's carrying him and the fact that she's in a parking lot, like it doesn't seem, it's not like he fell asleep on the couch. Like he did my first, thought is something's not right here. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to um, note some of the comments that folks are making in the chat. A lot of people are mentioning how quickly their eyes go to the target, the red of that target, and then the, uh, the camo, the camouflage that they're wearing. Um, uh, and I see some other hands are up. So Zemi, I'll let you do some of the conducting. If you can let us know who's like maybe the next two or three folks who are waiting to speak. Yeah, sure. So we have Marvin and then Molly Newgard. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Um, first of all, um, the boy is alive um, because I, I, I know what he's getting at with this. The boy is the target um, and she's carrying him as if he were um, uh, had been shot, but uh, he's not, but he is a target. And um, I, I like whoever noticed the camouflage. Yes, it doesn't help. His skin is still black. Right. Or so in this case, brown. Right. That the um, thank you, Marvin. That even the word target, like it's, it's right. Uh, it, it means it's a casual word, or it has one locations for people with some experiences and other entirely other associations for people with other experiences. And the way I think that he has framed, John Henry's framed this photo to make us think about what it means to be a target. And was Molly next? And then it looks like I can see Yu Yang and Madeline waiting. Am I missing anybody? Uh, that looks, yep, that's right. All right, so model, Molly, Madeline, Yu Yang, please. Um, yeah, I would say speaking to the target, um, well, one thing I noticed in particular is the target is, the, the symbol is out of focus, whereas the, the subjects, um, the mother and child are clearly into our focus. And I think someone else, a couple of people mentioned this in the chat, but um, you know, she, she does not deny looking like directly at us. She, she wants to capture our, our attention and draw us into her to almost to like create this sense of um, accountability or witnessing. Um, the other thing I noticed too are the white cars versus the, the black bodies um, as contrast. I'll yeah, I'll, I'll save my thought about those cars, but thank you for noticing it. I, I think we're waiting on Madeline and then Yu Yang. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I put the same kind of thing in the chat, the white cars I didn't mention, but the isolation that there's no one else there except for the person vaguely seen in the doorway in the background that there's very emptiness here. There's, there's a real emptiness, that and the white cars and uh, you know the same kind of focus thing. And that she is looking at us, not at her child. Um, and by the way, you, you mentioned, um, I hadn't seen John Henry's work at Blue Sky, but I have seen it, I think Smithsonian or National Geographic. I forget which one did a spread of his a few months ago. I think it was Smithsonian. Yeah. So I, I am familiar with his work and it, it's all very, incredibly but, poignant and stark. Right, the way in which this is a, a setting that implies population, but there, that 
there really aren't other figures that we can discern here. Right. Yeah, usually you'd see many people coming in and out. There'd be you know cars around and people. It's very isolating here. Yeah, Yu Yang, what were you going to add? Uh, yeah, uh, I want to speak about the um the the the, the contrast uh, the contrast between the two figures and uh, all the things happening in the background. Yeah. Um. So. A lot of people have been uh, talking about the, 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 the this logo of targets as its like physical appearance and the symbolic meanings. Uh, but I also want to point out all the other elements, the trucks, minivans, and uh, crossovers, uh, white cars mentioned by um, uh, Molly and uh, Madeline's. Yes, I feel like they are a very uh, quintessential sim symbol of suburban life truck, big SUVs, and then all this building, the, this target building, the style of this building, and then the, 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 the appearance of this parking lot also give me a sense that it is a in a suburban area, like suburb targets. And um, just all this like, and um, culturally and societally, um, uh, black and brown community are largely um, um, isolated from this suburb uh, suburban uh, life and the, this uh, environment and I see this this contrast uh, in terms of um, in terms of the subjects and um, the background and um, and also uh, just re referencing what has uh, what have happened um, this 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 Monday what happened in Colorado I just, yeah uh, I can't help thinking about, you know, the parking lots, a supermarket slash grocery store, and then the targets, and then just connecting everything, everything from this photo to um, the, the tragic that we are witnessing in Colorado and then, you know, um, uh, Atlanta, just like, you know, all the things just start to speak into each other. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I, I think that there's also this difference between, so, and somebody asked this, I don't, you who come regularly know, I don't like to talk about the artist's intent because for me, it's more about how we're responding emotionally and intellectually to the work. But John Henry's photos are all staged photos and they are usually of um, families that he has met only through this project. Um, so, and we'll look at some more of his work after this. Um, but to come back to that, thing about who's in what spaces. It's true that we are reminded this week, I was on my way to the supermarket when I heard about the supermarket shooting, right? That these shootings can happen anywhere because of the way that guns are ubiquitous in our country and the way that male anger is justified in its use of violence in our country, but that there is also a particular targeting here. I wanna note a couple things that have passed by in the chat. Um, and I think that it's, you're right about the cars, the folks who've been noticing the cars and the kind of the suburbanness, but they are, they may not actually all be white cars. Some of them may be silver, but they bring whiteness into this picture versus the brownness of the skin and the brownness of the building and the way that that does fit into the camouflage of who is targeted or who is at risk or what is hunter and what is hunted. Although somebody else noted that the target can also be read as a halo in this picture. And that it, it had not occurred to me. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't remember who it flew by out of my chat, but, um, but I think that that's an interesting read. And something that I only noticed about the 12,000th time that I looked at this picture was thinking about the places there are red. Some people mentioned the taillights. There's also the red behind her. And there was a point where I thought that also looks like it could be, your mind can read it as blood if you're thinking about a shooting, right? That, that there's sort of this sense that red has splattered the scene. Um, Marvin's been very patiently waiting to, to say something else. Yeah, well, as I said in the chat, look at his left foot. Um, that can't be coincidental. Mm -hmm. uh, it's lined up too perfectly, uh, outlined by the white parking strip. Yeah. And it looks like the kind of line that they would draw around a body in the parking lot. And that's what it, he's pointing to, is that basically this young boy is destined for that white line. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I don't, 
I don't ever feel quite comfortable saying that has to be intentional in terms of photographs, because we know sometimes something turns up in the photograph that you hadn't anticipated, even as the taker of the photograph. But I think the way that we read them, we can always talk about and that thinking about the outline of the body and the outline of that, that, that the outline of that body part makes us think about the outlines of bodies of people who have been vic the victims of violence. The woman in this photograph is holding our attention with her eyes um, and what, what we might respond to her expression as being. Any more thoughts on this photograph? Is there any other folks waiting? No. Nope. Okay. So let's take a breath because now we're about to look at uh, the first poem. And um, I've decided to pair all of these photographs with poems by Denise Smith. Um, and they're just, I think, one of the most powerful poets writing today. Um, people are sort of talking about the, the, a little bit about the gaze in the chat, but here's our first poem and I'll read it. Juxtaposing the black boy and the bullet. One is hard and the other tried to be. One is fast and the other was faster. One is loud and one is a song with one note and endless rest. One's whole life is a flash. Both spend their life trying to find a warmth to call home. Both spark quite the debate. Some folks want to protect them some think we should just get rid of the damn things altogether. So, I open up your thoughts uh, on this poem. Does this poem make us think differently about black boys? Does this poem make us think differently about bullets? Yasmin, um, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. You said in the chat, you love the ambiguity of the poem. Could you tell us, maybe unmute and tell us a little bit more about that? Well, the thing that really stuck with me was that last line where um, they, I guess they say, some folks want to protect them. Some think we should just get rid of the damn things altogether. It just struck me that, is that talking about the black boy or the bullet? And I, it, I assume that there's, that's purposeful ambiguity. Yeah, and for me, that ambiguity floats all the way through the poem, right? When I think about which one is one and which one is the other, what is loud and what is a song with one note and endless rest? One's whole life is a flash. Let us presume that Denise Smith, who as I might've mentioned, is an incredibly gifted poet, has the possibility to not write ambiguously if that is the intent. So what's the effect for not just Yasmin or for any of you as readers of this poem, what's the effect of that ambiguity? As jump in again, if you like. Uh, I'm not gonna, can, uh, well, people are in the chat, so maybe we should go to the chat first. I don't no, want to jump Madeline, in. why don't you go and then Yasmin, I think wanted to jump in again. I think, I'm not answering that question. I don't, I haven't thought that out, but the line that gets to me is that both spend their life trying to find a warmth to call home. And I don't see that in a bullet. So this is where I lose, what are we talking about in that line? because I, you know, the others seem to, one is hard, the other tried to be, and then they seem to inverse order of who is fast, who is faster, get rid of them. Again, that ambiguity, but both spend their life trying to find a warmth to call home is, strikes me as the most puzzling piece of this. Yeah, and some folks are responding to that in the chat. Stephanie has said, maybe warmth equals flesh. Nancy said, yeah, it makes me think about a heat-seeking uh, missile and 
there's a there's a poem that I thought I was might include today that I ended up not because I decided to sit just with Janez Smith's poetry. But there's a poem called "On the Last Day the Bullet Is Asked" by a poet named Sadia Hassan, and you can find this poem online. At, it's at poets.org. I know, which is about the. It's as though somebody's interviewing the bullet that uh, killed Medgar Evers, right? And it is a similar thing. This idea that. Bullets have one job to do, which is to lodge into the thing that they are being shot at. And that what happens when we start to think about that as a warmth to call home. I do wanna circle back to that other question about what, what the effect is of the ambiguity of moving back and forth, not always quite knowing or being able to tell the difference between when we're talking about the bullet and when we're talking about the black boys. It looks like you, Young, and then Yasmin, and then Molly. Okay, thanks. Um, I think the ambiguity of this poem um, also means uh, means that there's a difficulty to to find the clarity in in these lines, and this difficulty in finding the clarity in these lines echoes to how the echoes to the actual, the, you know, all the difficulties in dealing with this sort of issue in real life, like mm, speaking up, speaking up, ra uh, ra races, gun control, like firearm controls. There, the I, I feel, I feel like this just like the what what we are de what what we are dealing right now it's is like we are we are in a very muddy water and we don't know we don't know what what we are trying to uh, accomplish on but no i'm trying to say what, we don't know where is the end goal and um and we have been de uh, so uh, stuck so deep in this muddy water and um we don't we we um everything becomes a very uh becomes ambiguity and uh, uh, yeah and and what, what I'm trying to say is is this like this 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 parallels a parallels between between the words and the, the reality we're we're dealing with and uh, I'm just thinking about think also thinking about you know um, the the firearm violence and then you know the the the, the difficulties that we're facing uh, when trying to control and uh, minimize the uh, minimize the, the 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 harm brought by the violence. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Who is up next? I can't remember. Uh, Yasmin. Um, the thing that the ambiguity brings to mind to me uh, is, you know, as as you were reading it, I'm like, oh, okay, the boy is this, and the bullet is that. The boy is this, and then by the end of it, I'm like, wait a minute. Denez is purposely making this ambiguous so that we have to stop and think who would actually think the opposite of what we're thinking. That's what I, that's the thing that it brought to mind for me. Yeah, that uh, protection and getting rid of the damn things altogether. The idea that that can apply either to bullets or black boys and that so much of this is about who prioritizes what. Was Molly up next? Yes. Um, yeah, to, to build on what, what everyone has been saying, um, juxtaposing the black boy and the bullet, um, Yu Young mentioned this, but I think there, there are these parallels. It's really like the parallels between the black boy and, and the bullet and that, that then that amb ambiguity that plays out. Um, I feel for me as a reader, it makes me, um, and Yasmin sort of spoke to this, um, makes me assert my own positions much strong, much more strongly or think think through those because it is about debates. And yeah, these are two issues that spark so many debates yeah. on so many sides, um, but it helps me to assert, okay, where, 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 how do I feel about these things personally um, when I see it in this, in this poem here in this, you know, it's not, it's not verbose in terms of words, but it's, it's so powerful, right? Um, so it just, it makes me think that much, that much harder. 
yeah, I mean, in some ways, this poem is is a, a song with one note and endless rest. Um, it's not only is it few words, but if you think about, if, you know, I'm always interested in the tools that a poet uses in their craft. And, um, you know, we we're, we're grow up thinking about rhyme as the most basic tool of poets, although many poets today don't use rhyme. Repetition is huge in this poem. There's alliteration and assonance, but just a lot of repetition. So we could count up both the number of words overall and the number of different words, because one is and the other, one is and the other repeat all through this poem. And with so few words to create something so powerful is in some ways, I think, creating the trajectory of the bullet. Um, I'm, I need to scan my way through the chat, but Zemi, is there anybody else waiting with a hand up? Yeah, Marvin. Okay, thanks. Okay. This poem stands in an ancient tradition that gives it a little bit more meaning, beginning with the Aeneid, which begins, I'm a Rimke Cano of arms and the man I sing, and um, the Wilfred Owen poem, uh, the Arms and the Boy. Uh, and, and if you set it in that context, you see that basically it's several a thousand years, uh, more than a thousand years of, of tradition of uh, juxtaposing the human body and the bullet or the sword. Yeah, thank you for that. Because I, because one of the things, Dinez's work is unbelievably contemporary and also incredibly informed by a particular tradition that he's writing both from and against, I think, to, to that. And for those of you who don't know Wilfred Owen's poetry, uh, out of the era of World War One, there were a lot of poets writing about the horror of that war. So it's not, um, it's not a celebration of war per se, but a recognition of that violence. And I think I even see that Francis is, has a hand up next. Yes. Um, in talking about the ambiguity and the way that she weaves it throughout the poem, I'm struck by the ambiguity itself is almost like a gun cocked and aimed at the word things. Can you say more about how it is aimed at that word? Because that word things is so provocative. And the boy, the bullet, the bullet, the boy, and the twisting of that and the weaving of that seems to come all together in the word things. Yeah, and I'm not sure if you were, if you were getting at this or if I just want us to get at this collectively, but <laughs> even looking at the way that the words fall on the page, right? Like this is um, not a classic, there are, there are poems where the words make a shape on the page. Um, George Herbert is probably the most famous poet that did this, you know, would write about it, uh, wings and they, the words would come out as wings on the page. There's something going on about the shape of this page that I think is about, that it, it's a bullet shaped poem in some ways, but I haven't figured out how to get those last lines to fit my reading of the bullet shaped poem. Um, but I, your idea of the trajectory is, a, is an interesting way to read that. Um, Looks like Marvin yeah. has a hand raised. Well, my searching for that illusion, and you were you were questioned this line, uh, trying to find a, a warmth to call home. So I, I grabbed my my Wilfred Owen book here, and I found this line, and it, it, I don't know that she's referencing it, but it says, uh, "Lend him to stroke these blind." blunt bullet heads, which long to nuzzle in the hearts of lads. Yeah. But that's it right there, trying to find a warmth to call home. Yeah, thank you for that reference. I didn't expect, I didn't know that that's where we were gonna go and I appreciate your coming upon it so quickly. I wanna underscore, Dinesh Smith uses they, them pronouns. So uh, in um, just to take care in respecting the poet. Of course, the voice of the poet and the, the speak, the voice in the poem is not necessarily the poet, but I think in this case, we are talking about Dinez's work. Um, I have other images for us to look at, but I don't wanna rush us past this poem. Is there more that folks wanna talk about in this poem? 
And I promise there will be more poems. Are we ready to go, Zemi, you think? Yeah, there is no one waiting at the moment. Okay, so here's my next image. Um, think about what this image is doing that, or what is similar. Looks like Madeline has a hand raised. Great, Madeline, start us off. It's similar in the sense of isolation from people. There's, again, this is just a mother and a son. Um, obviously, the age is different, the position, you know, but she's still holding him deeply. But it's that isolation. Here, of course, it's totally rural, but it, uh, my sense of isolation is what comes through. These people are alone in this. Does the isolation, what's the different feel of the isolation in what seems to be a nature setting as opposed to a parking lot setting? Does it have a different effect for you? Um, it's, it almost seems more peaceful, um, but it's still that they're alone in this, that this is a one-on-one -on -one situation, even though it's, it's a vast, we know that this has happened commonly, that this is a common event, unfortunately, but that they're alone in this grief. Yeah, yeah. Um, and is Geraldine have a hand up? Yeah, I just, so I'm not completely familiar with his work, but were some of these placements of the images like where the photographs were taken, like where the mother thought she would find her son in a way, like if he had been killed, so again, I'm less interested in okay. <laughs> John Henry's intent. I can answer that yeah. question. Okay, so um, don't answer that. Because from my feeling from this, yeah. is like they're from Little, Little Rock, Arkansas. Like if her son had been taken from her, where I'm just thinking to myself, this is where he would have been found. And, you know, like one was Target and the parking lot was very urban. He was a young child. Um, I don't know. This one's just heartbreaking. <laughs> they all well, heartbreaking, but... Mm -hmm. that uh, and Molly Major has noted in the chat like that there's something more threatening for her about this one this idea that it can happen in secret and I think that there is a long history of that in America too of um, black bodies black people disappearing and black bodies being found much later yeah uh, tortured as well as killed and so that may be one of the things that echoes here um, other hands up Demi uh, Albert, let's hear from Albert. There you go. I, um, my first reaction was it was like a hunted animal, uh, like a deer it would be out in the woods. And a lot of times a hunter, I think, will raise the rack of the a buck's head up to show you the rack. Uh, and I kind of titled it a deer, deer, because uh, she obviously is not the hunter, but uh, just hunting it in the, in the woods, and yet a lot of people are hunted. Yeah, and I thank you for that, thinking about it in terms of that hunting. I hadn't thought about the, the rack, the posing with the kill, which would be the opposite of posing with the loss. Um, and Marvin has commented on the landscape here is also, it's, this is not spring in nature, right? This is, everything is, is brown and looks a little dry and desiccated so that it's not, it, it's nature in a, in a season of decline rather than a season as we are enjoying now of revitalization. Um, is, does Chuck have a hand up? 
Yeah, yeah I was just was, I'm not sure. I, I dropped off for a minute there, sorry. But um, just wanted to point out, and it's hard to see when the image is small on your screen, but the, the, the power poles or the phone poles behind them are crosses. So there's sort of a very for or background of um, Christian symbolism in, in my view. And do you want to connect that to the figures by any chance? Well, little Mary and Jesus, you know. Yeah, there's a, a strong visual iconography. Um, and Molly Newgard has noted in the chat that uh, the Pieta is a big part of uh, John's work. And oh, how convenient that you thought to mention that because I've given you a Pieta to think about, although this is Michelangelo, they run in sculpture and painting throughout um, Christian European art for centuries. There certainly is the evocation of the Pieta of um, Mary cradling the dead body of Jesus that John's work is echoing. I think there are other cultural echoes for us to think about as well. Um, and I put a couple in there. For those of you who are part of the um, salon that we did for Zunli's work, Zunli's work is all about black men in the US as fathers. And I think it was one of our most challenging conversations because we came up against a lot of implicit bias in the way folks were reading the images through a lens in our culture that basically associates black men with being deadbeat dads, non-present non fathers or inadequate fathers. And even in our conversation, even though I had framed it as Zun Lee frames his work and as the poet that that work was paired with um, frames his poetry, we were thinking about this, Kevin Young is the poet, always in terms of positive images of men as fathers. This is one of the images that people were reading really negatively. So we also come with this notion of black parenting to these images. And I just wanted to throw this one in. Uh, as you may know, this is uh, Kamala Harris, who's now the vice president of the United States. But at the time this photo was taken was in the Senate. And this is during the confirmation hearings for Justice Kavanaugh. And I was thinking about this image recently, right before the inauguration earlier this year, her stepchildren were interviewed in the New York Times and her stepson referenced this photograph. Um, and he was talking about, uh, I remember I saw a tweet that someone did. It was a photograph. It was a photo of Kamala at the Kavanaugh hearing and someone tweeted like, I'd hate to have to look at that face. And I, at that moment, I'm reading the article in the New York Times and I froze because I was so expecting the rest of that sentence to reflect a deep misogyny that, and or racism, a term misogynoir, which is particularly about misogyny directed at black women, right? I'd hate to have to look at that face. And then the rest of the quote goes and explain why I'm late for curfew. Said, and I was thinking, I've literally had to do that, right? But what are the cultural images that we bring, not just from a Christian European tradition of the Pieta, but also the images that we have of Black families and Black parenting as we look at an image like that? How, does, how do all of those things resonate for you as a viewer of this image? And Stephanie has put in the chat, you know, what if the children in these photos were white? How would that change our interpretation? Uh, I saw Chris had his hand up, but um, looks like not anymore. Um, Madeline? Well, as an interesting point to this, John Henry's work is with mothers and sons, not fathers. And that's another question I have is what is the effect of it always being mothers. What do we make of that? Sometimes there are siblings as well, but the, the figures are always maternal figures. Molly, you guard? Well, and it, it just makes me think that, you know, black, black mothers in society have, have become resigned to the fact that this is their fate or their reality. Um, unlike perhaps any other mother in our American society. Um, and I think 
also just just the focus on mother and mother and son is powerful in and of itself because that relationship is mother and child is so um almost untouchable and so poignant and um and i think for for black women in america black mothers it has become something so much more complex and fearful yeah and i might even say for mothers of black children i uh, for a friend who is the uh, the who is not black, she's white, but she's the mother of black children, and she talks about how her she understands that people will listen to her talk about her experience of trying to mother those children safely in our white supremacist culture in a way that they will not listen to black women talk about their experience. That is to say, she her whiteness can't protect her children from that, but her whiteness can get attention to her position in a way that she feels like black women who's exp who are trying to enact the same protection for their children that she wants for hers do not necessarily get the same audience. Um, and Sandy has said black mothers are icons of strength as well. And that's as much by necessity as anything else. What, what I'm knocking my head for not thinking of putting in here is that another really important uh, iconography in the US is comes out of the anti slavery movement where often the cruelty of slavery is specifically depicted visually as well as it, uh, literarily in terms of children being sold away from their mothers right but it's it's usually a depiction that is about the maternal and that historians now are really doing hard work to excavate the experience that black men had as, as fathers in under enslavement and throughout the 19th century. So there's also this iconography of the, we're supposed to weep as white viewers. We're supposed to weep for the black mother who's losing her child to the slave auction. And what does it mean that we are a century and a half past that and that mothers are still losing their sons and fathers and aunties and grandmothers and siblings to this violence today. Um, other thoughts about this image? then I might take us to another poem. I have to move all the things on my screen so I can actually see the poem to read it to you. Not an elegy for Mike Brown. I am sick of writing this poem, but bring the boy, his new name, his same old body, ordinary, black, dead thing. Bring him and we will mourn until we forget what we are mourning. And isn't that what being black is about? Not the joy of it, but the feeling you get when you, you are looking at your child, turn your head, then poof, no more child. That feeling, that's black. Think, once a white girl was kidnapped and that's the Trojan War. Later, up the block, Troy got shot and that was Tuesday. Are we not worthy of a city of ash? of 1,000 ships launched because we are missed, always something deserves to be burned. It's never the right thing nowadays. I demand a war to bring the dead boy back, no matter what his name is this time. I at least demand a song. A song will do just fine. Look at what the Lord has made above Missouri, sweet smoke. Take a breath with this poem. What do we what do we make of it? What do we make of its title? What do we make of its literary allusions? In the same way that I asked, how did the second photo we looked at by John Henry, what was it doing compared to the first? What is this poem doing compared to the earlier poem by Dinez that we looked at?
you all are being very quiet. I think there are a few things in the chat. Okay. Yeah, Geraldine said, I can feel the anger more, obviously by the first line, I'm sick of writing this poem. So tired of the repetitive news of another killing, right? His new name, his same old body. I think that that is about, it's like, what does it mean to say their names and try and remember? Wait, Baltimore was Freddie Gray. Mike Brown was Ferguson. Um, and those are just the names that we know. Um, and Yasmin said also a weariness. Um, Molly said that line, that feeling that's black, which is really interesting because this notion that white people are curious about what it knows, what it's like to be black and what does it mean to ask your black friend, tell me what it's like to be black is I'm wondering about what we think about that line. Is Denise Smith indulging some ethnographic curiosity that white people have in that line or is there something else going on? It looks like Chuck has his hand up. For me, it's not so much about indulging curiosity. It's more like the speaker of the poem is sort of just saying this is, to me, is sort of this is what it is, whether you're curious or not, but wants you to know. Whether you, I don't think it's about asking in. It's about sort of saying, here it is. And so, and the comparison to the Iliad, which is sort of this classical reference of, you know, I guess what you might think of as this white, very white sort of classical edu edu education thing is like, is saying to white people, this is like one of your founding Western civilization documents. And you can understand that, it, can you understand that? Then maybe you could understand this. And yet also, this is so different than that, right? A white girl was kidnapped, that's black, that's the Trojan War, that was Tuesday, right? A uh, distinction between those two things. Although the Iliad confession, the reason I live in Portland is that 20 years ago, I came here to teach for three years at Reed. And every year I taught a class, not that I designed, where the first text I taught was the Iliad. And the first question I would ask the students is, is this a pro-war text or an anti-war text? And then I would say, I don't care what your answer is. I just want you to support it with textual evidence. But I think in many ways that poem is, it's, we can read it as a celebration of violence, but we can also read it as a condemnation of violence. And if you have not had the pleasure of having to read or teach the Iliad over and over again, in some ways it is a poem about grief that Achilles is grieving the death of his friend Pat Patroclus and then refuses to allow his enemy Hector to be properly buried. So this idea about the death of young men and what happens to them is actually all through that text as well. I've talked a lot, Molly has her, no, Molly Newgard has her hand up, I think. Um, in the first part I'm thinking, um, and actually looking at Stephanie's comment about a lack of real understanding about what it, um, what is being black. I think it's about the experience of that, but also an understanding of what the white person thinks the experience is. Um, and I don't know if, you know, if, if that's correct, but I'm feeling that it's almost like a, this resigned fact that this is my experience and this is what everyone else feels my experience is um, and should be almost. Chris, do you have a hand up? Yeah, I was just say I I, uh, I took humanities at Reed, so I had to write about <laughs> the Iliad too. And and my take on it, I don't know if it was pro pro or anti-war. I didn't. That wasn't 
asked. Maybe that was too dangerous a question to ask during the Vietnam War. But um, I was, I did notice that, that even though the war is not over, the end of the Iliad is at a moment of peace. So it's like, I, I think it's sort of in celebration of, oh, we stopped killing each other for a minute <laughs> without, without uh, any um, uh, assumptions that they we're not gonna start again tomorrow. One of the things that strikes me um, in this poem is that the first line of the poem is, I'm sick of writing this poem. And then towards the end, and this, when Denez publishes this poem in different versions, so it, it's near the, the end of this version of this poem, though not always of the poem altogether. I'm sick of writing this poem and then I at least demand a song, a song will do just fine, right? That the, that the poet in the classical European Homerian tradition is the bard, the singer of the song, the composer as well as the singer of the song, right? And I think that that's also about um, the role that the poet and the persona of the poem are taking on in this kind of commemoration. Marvin, did Marvin. you want to? It's not necessarily relevant, but also the bar that they took the life of a young white woman in order to get the wind for Agamemnon's boats. So yeah, this this um, white woman was was uh, kidnapped, but there was another one who was sacrificed to the wind. Uh, yeah, we could talk about class difference, maybe. I would have to remember my Iliad better. Geraldine, did you want to jump in? Yeah, it, when you were referencing like the at least demand a song, a song will do just fine. To me, that's just more of the exhaustion, you know, like, oh my God, oh my God. But then just like, fine, write a song, you know, like, let's just, because there's this complete exhaustion as this keeps happening, like even with these two shootings last week, you know, some of us are a little dead and we're not reacting the same way, but there's this exhaustion to nothing changing. And yeah. I read it as that, like, I'm so sick of writing this, but all right, just write a song. Okay. I, you know, <laughs> but that's me. And when I look at those final two lines, look at what the Lord has made above Missouri, sweet smoke. And I want to say again, like, assonance, the sound repetitions, alliteration is so strong in Denez's poetry. Look at what the Lord has made above Missouri sweet smoke. They're gorgeous lines about a terrible thing, about, a, about Ferguson burning with the rage of people who are so angry about yet another death bring the body, bring the body. Um, and I think also calling us out, right? When, when, when a city is sacked that generates a great work of European literature, we're happy to think about the sacking of the city in a particular way. When people are rising up against the brutality of agents of the state, we wanna condemn that destruction of property and that I think many of us have been thinking about that in the past year in particular, and, and maybe much longer, the, um, the emphasis on cities burning or property destroyed versus lives ended, bullets seeking a warmth in black bodies. Um, are there other things that we haven't, that are on people's minds about this particular poem? If not, I thought next, um, I'm gonna do something I don't usually do, which is run through a whole bunch of the photos because I think it's worth thinking about what John Henry's work does as a body of work that maybe we can get more of a sense of if we 
switch over from looking closely at one image for a long time to sort of taking in a bunch of images together. So buckle up. What's your response? What does it provoke for you to see the range of these images that John's taken for this series? Yasmin? Well, I, I really, that first image to me seems kind of unique in that that mother, that the fact that she's wearing camouflage uh, immediately evoked for me, she's a soldier in a fight and her son is even wearing camouflage pants. Some of these other images that you've just shown us, there are these beautiful backdrops. Um, I mean, even this one right here, it's like, it's a beautiful sunny day. There are lovely flowers. Um, the second image to me evoked a piece that I didn't see in the first one. So I'm, I'm really curious about, um, is that first one intended to be different? So that's kind of what I'm left with. Thanks. Um, I think, is it Chuck and then Geraldine? Do I have the right order, Sammy? Chuck and then Chris and then Geraldine. Okay. I'm just struck by sort of the, as we go through the images that you just sort of flipped through, it's just like you feel like anywhere, anywhere, anywhere someone could get shot or killed. I mean, we don't, we're assuming that they're, that they're shot, but it just seems all the rural, the suburban street, the city street, the rural field in front of a house, it's the same scene, right? It sort of drills it into your head the way that the we see on the news, it's also drilled into your head. Yeah. Chris, I think you're up. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, that's interesting that you say that because that is a good that is a good thing. For me, the impact was more just, and here it is again and again and again, which is how, how it feels when you pick up the newspaper. I mean, or pick up your phone with a virtual newspaper on it or whatever. I mean, just the fact that this just keeps happening and happening and happening. And I think you're right to not sort of say, let's look at one in isolation and think we understand it. I think it has to do with the quantity and the, and the, the numbers. We did, we founded a project, uh, the Rauschenberg Foundation founded a project in New Orleans where uh, these, um, uh, wives uh, and mothers of incarcerated men uh, made life-size cutout photographs of their missing men. And they did a big demonstration with holding their missing men. And I thought it was such a powerful image. And, yeah. and, I, think, and, and I think it's the same thing, the sort of numbers <laughs> works this the same way as that did. And I would say too that, and people are thinking about what the normalizing or desnormalizing, numbing. But I think there's also a particularity. I will tell you, it was incredibly challenging as it is often the case with when I'm doing these sessions to decide which images to talk about, but that there is, there's a difference. This one is the Miracle Mile in Chicago, the one where the family seems to be in front of their home. The, there's one that we looked at, uh, was it, it was in the series, uh, it's an alleyway. And if you look very closely, one of the people I was with in the gallery when we were looking at it um, noticed that the woman in the photo is wearing a sticker from, I can't remember if it's the Hammer Museum or Mocha, one of the LA museums, maybe LACMA, right? That there's, um, that there's the particularities, the, the ages and the types of these bodies for both the mothers and the sons, the places where there are siblings or not. That to me, it's also, important that one image doesn't stand in for the whole experience, 
because the variation in the images is also about the individuality and the humanity of each loss or potential loss. Geraldine, what did you wanna add? Um, so yeah, I was just wondering if you could go back a couple images to the woman that's sitting alone in the room and there's not a sun on her lap. Yeah. yeah. So I was intrigued by that one because it's so different. And I don't know if there anyone has anything to think about this one. And she's waiting to find, like he's not been found. It's the unknown. I, I will say that this is the only one from this part of this body of work that I included, but there are a number in the body of work in which the, the mother is without the body of the child. And I think the um, implication is that time has passed. And one of the reasons that I used this one was that there's also, I'm pretty sure this is the same woman. Um, so there, there's the photograph of a different way of thinking about grief and grieving and loss, the, ab the absence that just is a continued absence. Marvin, did you wanna? Look at that chessboard. It's a partial game. Uh, and it's been pushed up against the wall, so there's no longer room for her partner. And I think that's the expression of loss. Uh, she's not carrying the body. She just has no one to play that game with anymore. Yeah, that's a great read. Thank you. And that um, also a reminder again that the, the human figures are really compelling, I think always in photographs, but in this set of work in particular, but often in those other details, he's carefully conveying things. Chris, did you wanna add something? Yeah, I was just gonna to add to that observation, which I think is very strong, is that it looks like she's moving her pieces, but his pieces aren't moving. <laughs> he's, he's not getting a chance to participate in the game. Right, the game, the game moves forward, but only for one of them. I'm just gonna say thank you for pointing that out because that's an amazing observation. <laughs> and I will now indulge those of you who wanna know a little bit more about this body of work, which I only know about because I came to John's wonderful talk, which I believe you can now watch on the Blue Sky channel on, on your uh, YouTube. Um, so he finds people often through connections, if you know any, black mothers and sons who are living in the state of Utah. He was looking for somebody there in particular. He travels to the place where they live and photographs them, often only meeting them at that point in person, which was really interesting because he said like, I don't know what their bodies are gonna look like. It's not like setting up a portrait for somebody that you know. So if you think about, sometimes the, the sons are young or just small in relation to their mother's bodies and sometimes not. And so you have to pose them around who they really are. Um, but that he shoots, he doesn't take many actual images on each shoot. So there's a, a need to, um, to really set it up. And he compared it more to painting in the sense of composition. Um, and that they kind of work, I think, co in collaboration on the pictures, the subjects and with him as a photographer, but he also just maps out the area. He doesn't drive, he confessed, good New Yorker. Um, and so he uses Google Maps uh, or some mapping software, I shouldn't promote a corporation, um, to figure out where to locate the, the pictures near where the family happens to be. But it's, he wants it to be proximate to their neighborhoods. And he said, in part, that also means that the experience echoes for them afterwards because it's spaces that they will um, pass through. Somebody's asked what the image is on the back of a chair. It's not an American flag. Um, I can't quite identify what it is. Marvin, did you want to jump in with something? Oh, Marvin, I think you need to unmute. There you go. This is, this is a middle class home, very specifically a, a middle class or upper middle class home based on just simply the way the room looks and the furniture. And he's also saying that it affects every class of black. Yes, that class is no protection against racism in America and against violence in America.
other things people want to jump in on this picture or other ones, Chris? Well, I'm just going to second that class aspect to say that when the, the NBA season um, restarted, the, the players were very sharp to say, yes, we're millionaires, but this could be us. And Barack Obama said, this could be, this could be me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have one poem that I know I want us to end with, but another poem that we might discuss first. How are people feeling for time? We were a little over an hour. One, one parting poem just to leave us a little lighter or a heavy poem and to discuss and then a parting poem to leave us a little lighter. What are people feeling like? <laughs> Cheryl is, is voting for one. I can only see like three people on my screen. So I'm here, you're getting a sense. Light up, yeah. people. Okay. Yeah, so I think I, one. <laughs> I will again recommend the wonderful poetry of Danae Smith, but not actually make you look at this poem. Thank you, Marvin, for voting for poetry. I wanted <laughs> to leave us with this little prayer. Let ruin end here. Let him find honey where there once where there was once a slaughter. Let him enter the lion's cage and find a field of lilacs. Let this be the healing. And if not, let it be. Again, I wanna say thank you um, to Blue Sky for letting me create this space and to all of you for coming back into this space over and over month after month. I don't, think the conversations alone will nothing changes until we start having the conversations. Um, and I hope that this is part of the healing with the recognition that it's only a small piece. So thank you all for your time and attention. And if anybody else has final thoughts you wanna share, please do in the, in the chat or with a raised hand or we can just let it be there. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. I think that, as you mentioned, the conversations are a place to start, um, create awareness and dialogue and exchange of ideas. And you bring that forth for all of us. So thank you month after month for doing this. I want to second that because I listen to um, uh, presentations from other museums and cultural organizations. And this is the only one where I don't feel lectured at. It's, um, it's participatory and I appreciate that. Always, I, I like to think that I'm the most brilliant person, but actually not really. I'm much more interested in, in facilitating the conversations that we all can have together. Um, yeah. And uh, I do want to warmly recommend more of both the photographs and the poetry that we looked at tonight to all of you. We, I'm not sure what we're doing at our next salon, but we know that it's going to be what date? Molly, do you remember? Um, let's see. It is, it's, it's always going to be the fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, and Lois has been very kind um, and generous with her time to agree to continue to do this indefinitely. We've, we're almost at a year, as she mentioned at the beginning. And to me, it's one of the highlights of my month. Um, and I know for many of you who come back time and time again. So tell your friends, um, but we will continue. And again, always in relation to what's going on in the gallery. So um, Lois, that, that, that will come um, via Blue Skies website and social media in terms of what that subject matter will be once Lois has a chance to see the work in person, so. Which might be a good time to plug what's coming up in the gallery, Zami. Yeah, we have, um, a show curated by Nicole Jean Hill of work by Laura Webb Nichols. Uh, she was a photographer and collector of photographs. Um, she lived in Wyoming um, when they were having um, a population boom and um, early 1900s into the 30s. So, and she has a rare, unique view of the West, the American West. Um, so that's going to be a fun show. And then we have Johnny Chapman, who is like John Henry and Enfoco 2020 fellowship winner. And his work um, 
is about also the American West and his inserting himself in these iconic landscapes as a black man. And so I think they're a really interesting pairing together. And say somebody wanted to see those in the gallery, what would that person need to do? You can go to our website. So blueskygallery.org, which I'm sure you've already visited. Um, it's under who we are and there's an appointment uh, menu item there. And so you can just click on the time and we're extending our hours in April, Wednesday through Saturday still. And then it'll be 12 to five instead of 12 to four. So just an extra hour in there. Hopefully more people can see the shows. Great. So we hope to see you in the gallery and here again at the last Wednesday. Oh, no, the fourth Wednesday. Fourth. Sometimes fourth Wednesday. It's, yeah, not, necessarily, was, yeah. fourth it's not necessarily the last Wednesday, the fourth Wednesday of, of, of April and months beyond. Thank you all. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Bye -bye. Happy birthday, Chuck. Happy birthday, yeah. Chuck. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. First time I've been okay. here, I'll be back. Thank you. Great. Great. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Have a good night. Thanks, Molly.